Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on if you're in Europe or in the States. Um, my name is Ed Goldberg. It's my pleasure to join you this morning to talk a bit about what we can do for our organizations, for our institutions, uh, to prevent knowledge uh, that we use in the course of doing business from leaving our organizations. Um, as a, a, my role at, uh, um, is with Eversource Energy. It's a, it's a large utility in the Northeast United States and uh, electric, gas, and some water. Um, in my role, it's sort of my job to worry about things, if you will, as a business continuity and disaster recovery uh, uh, lead. Um, and, and, and to that end, what we tend to worry most about are the things that we've overlooked. Uh, things that we didn't put into the plan, didn't think about, and so forth. And, and one of the things that comes up often in the course of doing business, but it isn't often seen as a risk to the business, is the loss of knowledge. Uh, and, and, and to talk to that, we sort of has to have to think about our own organizations and how we, how we created the knowledge in the first place. So, so our organizations uh, make something or sell something or do something, um, and it's based on some, some sort of expertise, process, procedure, a method, something that differentiates us from our competition, perhaps. Um, and, and depending on what it is, it, it likely resides in the minds of the people that work there. So, you know, you can think in terms of, of say, sales. Someone who's in sales, there's one salesperson who's better than the others, and they have certain methods. And it would be great to duplicate whatever it is they do if they're the best salesperson. Um, and those methods would be passed on to others. But, but we know that that's a difficult thing to do. Manufacturing processes have best practices. Some organizations are able to assemble things better or design them better in the first place. Um, somebody's doing something that creates value for the organization, whether it's in engineering or, or IT or whatever. Um, and, and, and as people either develop that knowledge or learn it along the way, they, they as people, have intrinsic value to the organization. Um, one of the examples I, I, I like to use some years back, um, there were some large printing press manufacturers uh, here in the Northeast uh, U.S., and and it was to some extent you know an engineering marvel that these machines as complicated as they are uh, with so many moving parts um that they would be able to operate at such a high speed with such precision and have such um grand output you know vo volume and quality of the printing uh, material that would come off of them and the people that assembled these these machines there were certain people that were, were generations in the business. You know, a, a, a person whose, whose son would go into the business and their son would go into the business. And, they, they, and it was a male-dominated business. I'm not being chauvinistic by, by, by saying that. Certainly things have changed. But they, they would know how to do things that weren't in the books, that weren't in the assembly manuals and so forth. Things like, like just the right way to heat up a bearing, to get the bearing to slide over a journal and then be able to put that on a roller that goes into the press. And, and if someone came in off the street and you showed them the assembly instructions, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to put it together because it was because of the tolerances being too tight or whatever. And the tight tolerance, tolerances contributed to the quality of the print. And if you were to loosen it up so that anybody could assemble it, you'd lose quality. So, so there, there's, there, there's that end of things where you're relying on people who don't know just how to do something, a highly skilled trade. And then you, you can go to probably a good example of where an organization has sought to minimize the level of knowledge needed to do something. And, and I, I like to point to McDonald's, the, you know, the, the hamburger restaurant that, 
that for fast food, the consistency of the product is, is whether you like it, it's not necessarily good stuff, but it's it's always the same. And the people that are doing it don't really have to have a lot of skills to do so. People come and go there. I, I don't know that they have a high, an unusually high turnover, but my guess is that that when someone quits and, and moves on, uh, they don't worry too much about the next person coming in and, and not knowing what that person who left took with them. The knowledge is in their, their processes, in their books, in their machinery, and uh, it's designed so that they can take almost anyone and put them into the role. So you have those extremes. Um, and the value that they can do, that people contribute to an organization varies based on, on on what content they have in their head over the process. So, so there's personal differentiation. The people in sales, for example, when they leave, they're not likely to pass along how they were able to be the the best salesperson in the organization because it's a competitive advantage. And uh, in, in fact, sometimes they'll even try to steal the customers. Never mind, take the process with them, right? Um, and, and same thing for brand differentiation. No one shares trade secrets amongst their competition. Um, there are roles where you have to learn on the job, um, from an apprentice uh, alignment, for example. You need to be out in the field and, and learning from your peers for a number of years before you're really you're really good at it and you're fully uh, you know journey level. Um, sports are like that. And I know I'm pointing out the obvious here. Um, it, it, the intent is just to put some some context to the discussion that I'm gonna that I'm gonna put forth. Um, so so we'll move into the presentation. Um, let's see, right here. Got it. Okay. So so taking the knowledge that exists with people and preserving it so that the company has that, that organization has the knowledge going forward um, is, a, is something that's very critical, but it's also often overlooked, that we take it for granted that, um, that everybody knows what everybody else knows, or that if someone leaves, that we'll, we'll be able to you know, carry on because uh, certainly no one's indispensable, and you know, we, we know that. But in fact, that may not be totally accurate if they know something that's helping the organization, but they haven't managed to capture it for future use. So sustaining knowledge with an aging workforce. So the first thing is um, the, the, the workforce, uh, we, we've just come through you know, the baby boom um, and uh, uh, the, that slug of people that were born, uh, you know, there's a definition of those years, but I, I wanna say it was like after World War II until somewhere in the very early 60s. And those people are retiring now. Um, they've been in the workforce for for forty years or, or more in some cases, and uh, it's it's time you know they're being replaced and so forth. So there's a large a large factor with the aging workforce. Um, there may be succession planning in your organization. The organizations are evolving. Certainly, there's an infusion of technology that wasn't there before. They're all factors that that may help or or work to the detriment of this process. Transitioning collective knowledge without housing any unnecessary data. So uh, in the old days, you had file cabinets full of papers, all kinds of documentation that was saved along the way. And the problem with it isn't that you've lost anything, it's that you've saved everything. You have a collection of data that is very hard to search, hard to know what's in there, may or may not be useful, and in fact, I don't know what the percentage is now, but there's an enormous percentage, you know, probably well over 90% of what's in file cabinets still to this day that no one will ever look at again. But we're not going to get rid of it because we're afraid that we'll throw something away that we might need. It also might be legal hold requirements as well. So we, we, we want to be able to save the information that we need and not save the information we don't need. Um, so uh, we don't want data. We want something useful. Using practical tactics for balancing new and experienced employees during a transition period. Um, there, there's ways to deal with that, and it's and it's it needs to be a thoughtful process. And regrettably, most of the time, it's just um, happenstance, um, an ad hoc process where a new employee comes in. You may have some training, 
um, you know, depending on legal requirements, there may be safety training, um, sexual harassment training, how to get along with your peers training, and uh, where the cafeteria and bathroom are. And maybe there's more than that. I'm, I'm certainly oversimplifying it, but you get the picture. There's not generally a transfer of knowledge to new people from people that are going out the door because most of the time they've already left. Um, and then embracing retirement eligibility rates as an opportunity for a new way to do business. So with this turnover, bringing in new people, sometimes teaching the new people how to do it the old way isn't a smart thing to do. You might want to pick up some pointers from something that they, have, they bring to the table, either through their experience or their education, or simply because uh, they're of a different mindset generationally. So this is really change management. Uh, and, and it's an ultimate exercise in change management because it really tests the ability of an organization and the people in it to, to process this change. It's, it's major change. Daily, there's a sea of change. It's a, it's a highly uh, evolving um, uh, technological world. Most industries are in a sea of change. There's a, there's a lot of uh, the fact that we're talking internationally right now. This is not something we would have done some years ago. There was very little um, cross, cross the ocean uh, mingling. If you go back a few decades, um, uh, organizations weren't set up to work with, with peers in, in far flung lands. Um, but the fact is that, especially as you go get towards the end of your career, you start to get tired of that evolution of the change. We resist change, it's human nature, I get that. But as you get older, you're sort of set in your ways because you did, you, you've got a lifetime of accumulated knowledge that it, at least at one time it was valuable. And if it's still valuable, you really don't want to get away from it. If it's not valuable, you have a choice, which is you know to move on with new knowledge and new ways of doing things or to get out of the way. So we get to be less receptive to change. Um, and if it comes towards our retirement date, we might be looking at that and saying, well, you know, um, I'll resist. I'm not going to learn the new computer program. I'm not going to uh, do it the new way. And maybe I'll get a lousy performance review once or twice, but then I'll be out the door anyway, and, and I won't have to learn it. So I'll avoid it. There are people that do that. Uh, and in general, change management and change is hard. It's difficult. So retirement's a big change. Um, oftentimes, retirement is listed as a life-altering event, such as getting married, dealing with the loss of a loved one, illness, um, all of those major things that happen in our lives that are, um, you know, very, very disruptive. Uh, it's, it's one of those things. A lot of people don't want to retire. A lot of people want to retire and then change their minds. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a difficult decision and it's a difficult thing to deal with. So um, varies quite a bit person to person. So how do we motivate someone who's, who's probably going to be leaving for whatever reason, we're not going to get into that here, how do we mo motivate them to share? Um, the worst case I've seen is when, when a company outsources something and they have to do a turnover. So it's, it's okay to outsource something if the person or company that's outsourcing knows what to do. But the issue becomes you have something that you want these people to do and it's somewhat specialized and you need them to do it and learn it from the people who are being outsourced. So, uh, so I've seen an organization outsource its IT, which is a common thing. If, core, if your core business is not IT, then having someone do IT for you is a very common practice. There's lots of big companies all over the world that do this. And yet the turnover from the existing IT department um, Needs to happen sometimes, so you have to have some transfer. And it's very difficult because you're telling someone, and in this particular case, I'm going to use the example I saw, you're going to lose your job in six months. We're going to pay you a bonus for staying until the end of that six months, but you have to train your replacement. And they're going to sit with you at your desk for a month or two and you're going to show them what you do. And then at the end of that period, you're going to switch places. They're, they've been watching over your shoulder. Now they're going to sit in your chair and they're going to do your job and you're going to watch and make sure they're doing it right. And then at the end of that period, a couple of weeks or whatever, 
um, you'll get a severance package. Um, this is brutal. I mean, this is like digging your own grave in some some uh, ways of looking at it. Um, granted, there is some money involved, and that's the incentive, but it isn't by choice that you're leaving, and that makes it all the, the less desirable that you you really don't want to help. You're inclined to be bitter, um, and so that that's a worst case. But something along those lines happens with everybody who leaves if we want to preserve what they know. So sustaining knowledge with an aging workforce, succession planning, and 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 uh, whatever industry you're in and the type of evolution it's going through, it's likely going to change. Um, you're looking to move that knowledge into somebody else. So that's that's the first uh, so, somehow to capture it for the organization. So you can you, there's a number of things that have been done. Uh, and just listing a few examples here, you can imagine that there's others. Rotational assignments. So long in advance of people le leaving, what you're thinking of is, I don't want all of certain knowledge vested in one person. I want several people to know it. So we're going to rotate people on a regular basis so that we have a workforce with people who have some diverse knowledge. It's sort of the only way to learn it is to, is to actually tell them to do it. And so we'll have people take turns doing it. Um, cross training. Training's good. The problem with training is after the training, if you don't actually do it, you lose it. And so cross training has to be coupled with some, uh, some means of letting that person exercise what they've learned. Um, routine coverage and other engagement of alternates. So uh, I'm going on vacation for a week and I'm going to have uh, John cover for me while I'm away. And John has all the um, uh, 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 rights, privileges, and responsibility that I would normally have for that week. So, so, so John probably feels good about being entrusted with um, the larger organization and, and uh, uh, an opportunity for growth, perhaps. Um, there's a number of ways to couch it. Uh, delegating consciously for development. So giving people assignments that that grow their knowledge in a way that that suits the company so the organization has to have that consciousness of what it needs preserved and then make assignments to people so that they actually engage with the work that they would be doing if other people left so everyone gets a chance to play but they actually learn through a development process that's assigned to them um and minima minimizing the the tacit or tribal knowledge. So if something needs to be kept a secret because it's a corporate uh, you know, trade secret or it's a, a military secret or whatever, understand that. But there still has to be more than one person with that knowledge. When one person knows something and no one else knows it, uh, that's trouble. That has the potential for that person um, to leverage that knowledge uh, in, in an unpleasant manner against the company to leave and take the knowledge to another organization um, or to you know, concentrate on perhaps doing harm to the company at some point because they're disgruntled. Um, so we know that that's bad. We know that having one person know something that no one else knows is a problem. Um, you see that a lot in small businesses. You might see it as, a, as an example in a restaurant where there's a renowned chef and the chef leaves and the restaurant's never the same. Um, for better or worse, it's not a good process. So transitioning collective knowledge without housing the unnecessary data. So there's two. Let, let's let's um, talk a little bit about uh, some terminology, if you will. Um, we deal with two forms of institutional knowledge. Um, generally, there's explicit knowledge. That's formal knowledge. Um, things that are written down. They're objective. They can be shared. Um, you know, I'll give you some examples, but uh, words, sentences, numbers, formulas that comprise this knowledge um, don't need context, and you can share it pretty quickly. Tacit knowledge is that tribal knowledge. It's informal. It's unwritten. It's uh, not easily shared, and sometimes people don't want to share it. It's subjective. Um, there's a, a, a sense to it that, that people have. It's know-how. Um, it's, it's art, a craft, uh, could be technical that hasn't been, uh, formalized yet. 
um, things like images and beliefs and intuition. If we're going to transfer the knowledge from person to person, person to organization, preserve it, we have to know how to convert it from an explicit to tacit and from tacit to explicit. You need both types in an organization, but the key is how you manage them. There, there's a good reference book. It's, a, it's, it's old. It's, a, it's probably a couple decades old at this point. Um, but it's, it goes into detail on, on tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge and the durability of explicit knowledge um, while keeping in mind that to use it, you can only use tacit knowledge. Explicit knowledge is, is, a, is a procedure. Tacit knowledge is when you read the procedure and then you turn away from the procedure and do the work. Um, now it's tacit. You've internalized it and uh, um, you can use it uh, going forward. But they have to be converted to go from one to the other. We'll talk some more about it. The point to the context discussion I had at the beginning and then this initial lead up is that we have to consciously manage this. And, and I can tell you from my experience at several organizations, it's off the radar. No one's thinking about it. They're doing their work. They're, they're up to their eyeballs in day-to-day of -day, uh, um, keeping things running, fixing things, problem solving, um, meeting uh, goals and so forth. People are very busy. And then they don't generally take a moment, step back and look at what's going on and look for a vulnerability that isn't an external threat. So you deal a lot with external threats. What could shut us down? What could cause us, what could cause our building to be unavailable? What could cause our people to be unavailable? They get sick, we have a pandemic or something. What would cause um, our technology to fail or our supply chain? So you start doing contingency planning, you start thinking about all those things. The rarely do you step back and say, what about the, the, the knowledge that we use on a daily basis? What if we lost that? Because people don't consider that as a, a, a a likely scenario until until you have some in-depth thought and discussion about it when you realize there's a lot of people that know things and if they weren't here we lose that knowledge so we do a good job with explicit knowledge we're pretty good at uh, procedures and policies and 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 knowledge transfers through training and so forth we don't do well at all at recognizing uh, that tacit or tribal knowledge. It's rarely well managed. If someone's doing a job and they're doing it well, um, we, we tend to focus on, on problem areas and we don't, we don't gravitate towards that person or group of people or, or, or role in an organization and we don't worry about it. And, and it might be that that is a key concern going forward because of the gravity and the, the magnitude of the loss if that knowledge isn't available. So, so not recognizing it means we're not dealing with it, or not effectively at least. And so that's where the knowledge gets lost or, or mishandled at, at best. So, so how do we convert or, or transfer knowledge? And you go back to the beginning, converting from one type of knowledge to another is necessary to preserve it and use it. So you got two different types of knowledge, so there's four different transfers or conversions that would have to occur. Um, you can do the math, it's binary, but convert tacit to explicit, convert explicit to tacit, transfer tacit to tacit, or transfer explicit to explicit. So let's talk about those four processes. So converting tacit to explicit. Um, the the process for converting tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge is called externalization. It really doesn't matter what you call these things. Um, it's, it's, it's terminology that may or may not be useful to you, but it's important to know what it is. Tacit knowledge is internal. It has to be externalized to be transferred and used. So that means you have to re write it down, you have to decode it, you have to explain it, you have to make it understandable. And then you have to record it or write it, somehow preserve it and, and move it so that it's uh, in a place where it's available. So sometimes it might be face-to-face -face communication um, to, to get information out of somebody that uh, about how they do something and why they do it the way they do. Um, 
and, and that, that could be an interview process. Uh, it could be um, capturing best practices sometimes. We do okay with capturing best practices, by the way. That's com common, uh, common practice uh, within organizations to find out how others do things and to, and to uh, try to um, you know, copy it, if you will. Um, all, all organizations you know, seek to work with best practices. It's, it's sort of logical. Um, sometimes that could hold you back, by the way, because best practices can only make you as good as what others have already done. It's not, to, it's not particularly innovative unless you take it and then add it or mix it with other practices and maybe improve upon it. Converting explicit to tacit, uh, the, the process of converting explicit knowledge to tacit knowledge is called internalization. It makes sense. It's learning. Um, the process of converting what we think of as information into knowledge, it's information that's in a book, it's in a procedure, um, but it becomes knowledge when we internalize it and we learn it. Um, it's experiential. Uh, we need to personally adapt the information presented to, uh, in a way that we understand. Um, and, and again, that can be difficult because not everybody learns the same way. We know that there's there's uh, tactile learners, visual learners, auditory learners, people who have to listen to something or see something or, or, or hear something or, or, or actually do it. There's people that need to actually do it to learn it. So learning anything um, that's technical in this example, um, but pointed examples are learning how to drive, learning how to appreciate a fine wine. Those are a little more amorphous than following a step-by-step -step procedure on how to put something together or how to do something. Um, so it could be a complex uh, construct or it could be something simple, but usually there's some edge of complexity to it. Like there's a way to do this and we know how to do it, but to do it very well takes someone who's seasoned and we need to know what that person knows and what they do after they've had experience doing it. Tacit to tacit, um, this is internal. Um, this is transferring knowledge, and they call it socialization. Um, but you're not transferring it, you're not converting it into explicit knowledge. You're actually taking it and moving it from person to person. So the source and the destination are people. So it relies on a shared experience. Um, so one person acquires the knowledge from the other. So let me show you how to get things done. How do we do this? Let me show you what I do to make this happen. And you watch and you pick it up and no one's writing it down, but now the other person is able to do it perhaps just as well, maybe eventually better. It goes on between two or more people. It doesn't have to be a one-on-one. -on -one. It could be one person showing a number of people how to do it, but it hasn't been converted. So it's still tacit. So to some extent, you're also preserving the risk that existed before, although you're mitigating a bit because you have that knowledge in more than one person. You're sharing it. The more that have it, the better, but eventually you still have to deal with uh, transferring it again at some point in the future. Transferring explicit to explicit is called combination. Um, combination benefits a lot from technology. Uh, explicit knowledge is stored in documents and email and databases, so it can be transferred easily in meetings and briefings. So you might gather it through collection, um, disseminate it through um, publication, for example, and in the process you might edit it and do other things to it, other processing. Combination facilitates the movement of knowledge between people, groups, and organizations. So it's very easy to, easy to move about, as you might imagine. Um, procedures are created and disseminated. You, you have maybe controlled procedures. Sometimes you have non-controlled procedures. And generally speaking, um, when you turn it over, you might have some training involved. Why do you need training? Because maybe the procedure is too complex um, and not as well defined. And maybe it's a complex process and there is some tacit knowledge involved. But if it's purely explicit, it tends to be pretty simple. Go back to McDonald's uh, example from before. If you go into their, uh, they probably have a notebook or I don't know what they call it, 
but there's a procedure manual that tells you how to make the French fries. And they've, they've designed and built machines that make the French fries and ensure that the French fries come out the same way every time, as long as everyone follows the procedure. So it's, it's straightforward until it starts to get mixed a little bit with tacit, tacit knowledge. So practical tactics for, for practical tactics for balancing new and experienced employees. So here comes new employees, and we have experienced employees on the job. Don't just throw them together. There has to be some planning, some thoughtfulness to this. There's choices, logistics, and there's consequences to all the choices and logistics that you have. Ideally, when someone's leaving, we want to bring in their replacement before they leave maybe ideally isn't the right word because there may be times when you can't wait for that person to go so that you can bring someone in new and get a fresh start. In those cases, it may be wise not to have an overlap. But generally speaking, if you've got some tacit knowledge that's resident in the person who's leaving, then you want someone to come in and learn from them. You might also want to have someone shadow that process who might be able to convert it, record it, and save it for later so that it becomes a form of, of explicit knowledge. Um, so engaging the new employee to the extent possible to encourage a, a questioning attitude, that leads to a better transfer of knowledge. And what I mean is, earlier I mentioned the opportunity that you, that you have in an organization when one or more people are leaving, hopefully in a controlled manner, um, because you might be able to find a better way to do things. And someone coming in from the outside doesn't know what others have done previously. And sometimes that could be an advantage because they may come up with better ways to do things. There's an innovation that, that occurs when something has to be done and you're not told how to do it. What you come up with could be full of, of mistakes that have been repeated in the past. And that's where the transfer of, of the tacit knowledge can hopefully avoid that. So there's a mix here. And as you can see, managing it is all important. The pain of a transition, like outsourcing example I gave earlier, um, you're forcing knowledge transfer. Um, it, it's fraught with peril and it's very, very difficult to ma manage. If you're losing your job um, against your will and you're being asked to teach your replacement how to do your job, um, probably because they're gonna be paid less, um, it's just a wild guess. That's the way the world works. Um, there's going to be some bitterness there. And and you may deliberately, someone may deliberately leave out information or distort the information. Um, it's sort of in a vengeful, a vengeful manner or perhaps to preserve their own competitiveness and, and value to their next employer. A number of issues there. Um, so, so embracing those... Uh, eligibility rates uh, for retirement, knowing you have to know your workforce, you, know, you work with your HR department, you have to know who's at an age where they're going to be retiring or they're eligible to retire. Um, traditional pensions certainly have been fading away. It, it, it varies a great deal societally, depends on where you work, where you live, but um, utilities and government workers um, always had pensions and utilities have have been on the bandwagon for for more than a decade now of reducing that liability that that cost and and getting to a a more portable um, retirement um, funding process whereby uh, new employees don't get a pension but they get an enhanced savings plan if you will for retirement. Um, it's not just in the company's interest that they've done this for that reason younger people over the last 10 or 20 years have shown a propensity for for moving from job to job more often than people of of uh of that baby boom generation and thereafter where they went somewhere and and ideally found a job a career for life with one company um so that's changed quite a bit as well and and so those that portability um 
you know, facilitates their movement. It brings value to them. It makes the job more enticing. And so from a hiring perspective, that's more helpful at times than a pension. Someone who's looking to stay somewhere four or five years isn't interested in a pension. They're not thinking that long term. But we have to deal with that from a knowledge preservation perspective because now we have people that aren't likely to stay for their careers. They're likely to come, work, learn something, and and when they get bored or otherwise uh, don't feel the need to stay, they're gone. And we have to, I don't want to say the word facilitate it, but we have to manage it. So there's two ways that we can re replace folks when they're ready to leave is bringing the newbies up to speed with what we do and how we do it, or we take advantage of their newness and we engage them in teaching them what needs to be done and asking them how they might suggest getting it done. Uh, a mix of that is probably where you want to be. It avoids repeating mistakes of the past, but it engages them and, and you get some value out of the newness of the, of the new person. So new employees present challenges and opportunities, right? So they have less experience, they have less knowledge uh, than their predecessors most of the time. It may be that you're hiring an expert from somewhere else to come in and uh, Im improve your knowledge, but, but in, in most cases, there's a mix of that. Um, they're less likely, as I mentioned, to stay for decades. Um, so, uh, so the retirement structure uh, usually caters to that. They're not like us older folks culturally. So they, they enter the workforce in numbers. We have to change. Our organization has to change. Our culture has to change. Cultural change is very hard. Um, and if you don't want to set up your, your, your organization for, for a bit of failure in terms of um, cultural conflict, then that's another conscious uh, discussion that needs to occur and, and, uh, and, and managed. Um, not bound by the way we always did it, that, that's, that's the mindset to have. Uh, we don't want to anchor ourselves to the past. Everything's changing. Um, it's not just the, the uh, proliferation of technology and into business processes, but everything's changing. The whole, the whole business environment, this is old news. This has been going on for a long time. It's accelerating, if anything, and it's not something that's ever going ever gonna to stop as far as uh, most of us can tell. Fresh ideas, skills, education with the new people. They're generally energetic. Um, they're eager to use their knowledge, if only to compensate for their lack of experience. Now, that's a fragile thing, right? Because um, there's, uh, there's a number of issues there that could easily derail the eagerness, the energy, and um, um, there, there, there might be a sense of insecurity if they're not able to compensate for their lack of experience. So benchmarking and best practices we talked about just a few moments ago. Um, looking to incorporate best practices is smart, and benchmarking that measures that is a baseline for improvement. No reason not to do those things. Why wouldn't you? You don't want to live life in a silo and not know what others are doing. But combining best pra practices um, and, and, and doing something innovative in terms of uh, you know, those combinations is great. But it's not all innovative because, again, you're striving to do what others are already doing. That's typically what you get from best practice. So it's a good, it's a good catch up uh, strategy um, to catch up with what others are doing if you've somehow been lagging. But at some point, uh, if you want to be innovative and move ahead, um, that tends to be needs driven. Um, and so there usually are structural changes to the environment to get that process going. New people with new ideas can spark innovation but you have to manage it that way if you mismanage it they'll clam up you'll, you'll get nothing out of that very very easy to destroy that so have we been subject to environmental changes um, from the movie fargo where they say you betcha a lot uh we've had a change in the weather um there's been other natural and man-made disasters what we used to call black swan events things that were unimaginable uh, have, have so, somewhat become commonplace. I won't say that nothing shocks us anymore or that nothing surprises us, but we're getting there. Um, and uh, the things that have happened over the, the last decade or two um, are, 
are uh, were, unima- were unimaginable prior to that, and maybe that's the way it'll always be, but um, things have changed. Regula- regulations have changed. Um, the, 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 the whole data privacy issues, um, cyber crime, these are all things that have, have really affected almost every business, almost every industry, almost every society. Um, you know, I'd be hard pressed to come up with examples where where uh, that hasn't made a difference at all. So there's been regulatory sea change as a result of all that. There's been a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Depends on the industry. Um, the, the there are still lots of startups, um, which is where the smaller you know agile companies come from, who occasionally uh, hit it big. But the trend in most industries has been mergers and acquisitions. Um, going back to the 80s even, and even before certainly, but um, in, the, in the late 70s and 80s when, when across the world there was a, you know, energy um, you know, uh, embargoes and shortages and, and things of that nature, the, uh, the move was to deregulate the, the, the energy industry from uh, you know, oil production and oil transportation and so forth. And uh, when the, the oil companies came up with huge profits, as they said they would, that they they all said they were involved they would in, they would invest the money in exploration because that would drive uh, you know pulling more oil out of the ground and then the prices would go back down again and in fact they did explore and find more oil but at that time they found they explored other companies other oil companies and they bought other oil companies and that's that's where those mergers and acquisitions began. So there was a huge consolidation in the oil business back then. It's a textbook example of what could happen. Um, and it wasn't until a long time later that the production of oil out of the ground from other sources um, has uh, you know, eclipsed our, um, our, our need or our, our demand rate. So, so you, you end up in situations where you eventually you always get to a balance in the market, but it's, but it's driven by that. It's a very different environment. Technology, including the cloud, uh, and, and and the outsourcing that was enabled by the by technology, those both have been big trends that we've dealt with. Um, job markets, the economy, competition. Uh, we already talked about pensions, retirements, and those benefit plans. The cost of health health care has changed uh, in our our uh, environment. Um, public reliance on energy de- delivery because. And, and I would throw technology in there. People can't live without their smartphones anymore. We didn't have smartphones prior to about 2007. We're only about 12 years into that. And yet no one seems to be able to get by without it if it goes down for a few minutes, let alone for a day. Um, I actually remember once upon a time driving in a car and not having a phone with me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and and we did it. And today that would be a big risk. But, today, but back then uh, that was pretty routine. Nobody had phones in their cars and, or in their pocket. Um, but our reliance organizationally and personally on, on others to deliver uh, technology and energy, um, things that we were, able, were easily able to do without, we're not able to do without anymore. Um, the nature of threats has changed, and so has politics, obviously. Uh, definitely will not be discussing that today. <laughs> but this affects the 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 way people create maintain and transfer knowledge it's all part of the culture and the culture is what what supports what we're trying to do here so change change is substantial and ongoing and you can't isolate it you can't say well i'm going to change the way i hire people to accommodate uh the transfer of knowledge and not make any other accommodation um it would be uh, um, at best, marginally successful. They're, the over, overlooking all the other things that are in, in flux and in motion would, would be kind of foolish. It wouldn't be a complete plan. There's a difference between transferring knowledge and indiscriminately transferring culture. So if you replace the workforce with, with uh, inexperienced people and you try to get them to emulate the people who left, all you're doing is anchoring your future to the past. And based on the discussion of the prior slide, that's a pretty foolish thing to do. 
because you're not accounting for anything that's changed. And in fact, those people would likely disengage from that kind of a, a brainwashing, if you will, because they'd be coming into a situation where you're telling them that things are not changing and they know that they are. There's generally a, a, a three-step process to change management. Um, it goes back quite some years, but it's pretty effective. And you can read anybody's book about the seven steps of this or the 20 best practices of that, whatever number is in the title. But if you if you read it and then you say, well, does it include these three things? It always does. Creating a common understanding of what's wrong with where we are right now. Creating a common vision of what the future state will look like what's better about it, and then helping people move, giving them the tools, um, providing safety, letting them take risks, chances, um, uh, knowing that they won't get fired if they make a mistake and they should try things, obviously not ridiculous things, but something with some prudency to it. Um, that, that process pervades every change management process I've ever seen that's successful anyway. So we have some course information here that I think the moderator is going to talk to for a moment. Thank you, Ed, for delivering, the, delivering this very useful webinar. I want to inform you that PECB provides training and certification services for ISO 22301, Introduction, Foundation, Lead Implementer, and Lead Auditor. A PECB certificate will convey your dedication in implementing and managing these processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Uh, now we will go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions from the attendees regarding today's topic. So, Edward, the first question for today is, what do companies really lose in terms of knowledge when these generational cohorts leave their employment sooner than expected? Oh, it's a great question. Um, certainly, <clears throat> if you have people that knew how to do something and they live, they leave without teaching it to others, the people who come in have to learn that on the fly. Um, they will certainly repeat mistakes made in the past. Um, there's a wealth, I, I have to, you know, you know, go to what I know, um, having been in the energy is, industry for decades, um, linemen, do very, very dangerous work, climbing climbing uh, to, to uh, poles and towers and so forth to work on live, very high voltage wiring and switching equipment and, and so forth. Um, there's a set of safety protocols that no one will even be allowed to, to, to get out into the field until they, they demonstrate that they actually know those very, very well. Once they're out there, <clears throat> The linemen themselves know things that are very difficult to put down, like, like, like to, to, to record how hard to, um, you know, pull on a, on a cable to, to make it taut between a, a, a house or a business and a pole. It sounds like something so simple and that you could probably use a strain gauge or whatever, but you can't load people up with tools and they have to have a sense for what it feels like when they do things. And so... That type of knowledge, that tacit knowledge, um, tribal knowledge, if you will, very hard to pass on. And that's why for linemen, they have a journey process. Basically, you're an apprentice and you work your way up till you're you know, full, fully qualified over sometimes five to seven years to be fully qualified because there's so much to learn. Um, and the consequences of not learning it are so dire. So it's an extreme example, but it carries to almost anything else where someone knows how to do something. Sales is a great example. What happens if someone's a great salesperson? They leave, next person comes in and you need them to be just as good. They're going to fumble their way through it like the other person did at the beginning of their career. So there's a, there's a lot to be said for the knowledge transfer. Sometimes it has to be an on-the-job um, uh, apprenticeship, if you will. Thank you, Edward, for answering that question. And we have a second question here from an audience member listening to this webinar, which is, is there a software, an organization, which can use to track its current knowledge, knowledge it may likely lose to departing or disengaging staff, and how this knowledge can be conserved and transferred? 
Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, there's, there's a number of different facets to this, right? So there's two types of knowledge. We talked about tacit, we talked about explicit. The explicit knowledge generally gets, you know, in large companies, an example of how it would be maintained is in a system that manages procedures. So procedures generally have to be reviewed on a, on a regular basis every six months or every year or three years, whatever, depends on the type of procedure. There's a review cycle for it where people who are subject matter experts would have to review part of it. And then there's the um, you know, sign-offs and distribution, man, you know, uh, managing the procedures so that people have a, what, what you might call a controlled version where you know that it's the latest version and so forth. That would be the explicit knowledge. Tacit knowledge tends to be managed more in an HR, a human resources uh, sort of way. Um, or personnel, I don't know what it's called in other places, but human resources have tools, there's software tools and so forth, which, which keep track of qualifications that people have. It could be certifications, which are, you know, I, I, like the slide before where, where you talked about the different certifications that PCB, um, you know, offers. And when you have that certificate, others can look at it and know what you know about something. Those types of things would be tracked in an HR system. It would also track qualifications that are learned on the job through a number of years in a position or through school um, classes. Um, could also be safety um, um, qualifications that you have to have to do something. So if, if, um, if I need someone to do some welding and the person who does the welding is not here, um, can we ask John to do it? Well, we have to look and see what qualifications does John have to do the welding and, and what type of welding and, and is, is he certified in that type? So, the, so I think you're looking at at least two different processes there, depending on whether it's tacit or explicit. Thank you, Edward, for answering that second question. And for our third question from the audience member, we have how best can we manage tacit knowledge because they normally don't want to be controlled much? Yeah, that's the key. Um, so it may be a condition of employment that someone has to share. Okay, easy to say, easy to write it down. Implementing it is, is, is another uh, circumstance altogether. Uh, the ability to force someone to share it's probably not a good terminology used to say that you're going to force them to share, but but to manage it in such a way that you do on the job training, job rotations, things where this person's very good at that, and we're going to have someone else learn it. Um, you might make them a supervisor where they're actually watching other people do it. Depends on the scope of the organization, the nature of the work, and so forth. Um, you'd have to do it case by case, and and. The fact that you're asking a question is great because it's it leads to doing something about it and knowing that you know there there needs to be some some dialogue some discussion around what do we do to get um, to go to the small business example what do we do to get the chef to share his recipes we don't want the chef to leave and now we don't know how to make the things that our restaurant is known for. So do we write them down? Do we give the chef a couple of assistants? Um, what do we do? So watching over someone's shoulder sometimes is very helpful to make a recipe, but still you have to watch to see exactly what they do with it because that's, that's the key. That's why <laughs> the YouTube instructional videos for everything under the sun are so helpful because you're actually looking over someone's shoulder. They're showing you what they're doing. They're, they're telling you what to do. They're giving you the recipe, and they're actually baking the cake, and you're getting to watch them to do the whole thing. So, um, and and you know, anyone that doesn't go there when they have to change a light bulb on their car or whatever um, is, uh, you know, apt to make mistakes that others have made beforehand. Thank you for answering that question as well, Edward. Now, because of the time limitation, we will answer one more question for today and conclude the webinar. The final question is. How can you monitor the conversion of tacit and explicit knowledge process if it's being normally conducted? Ah, um, in in a one-on-one -on -one basis, 
you know, actually sitting and talking to people is probably you know pretty straightforward. So if uh, if you and I are exchanging knowledge for for whatever reason, um, whoever is directing us to do that might periodically sit with us and just ask, "How's it going? What do you you know? What have you done so far? What's next?" and that sort of thing. Um, certainly, at the onset of it, uh, whatever process it is, coming up with a project plan is smart. So having a list of the things that need to be um, uh, broached in that exchange would be smart. Um, and managing the whole thing as a project makes sense. I saw it done on a larger scale. Uh, I'm going to say between two and 300 people that were actually leaving the organization and two or 300 new people coming in from another organization to take over from them with, uh, you know, and end of term bonuses and all those sorts of things. And that was definitely, uh, you know, you had project managers, formal project management processes um, used to keep it, keep track of it all. Um, it is incremental. So, you know, you can have a weekly report or, a, you know, whatever necessary to see what's been done and what hasn't been done. I, I, I would I would offer that, you know, a project plan up front, no matter whether it's a small transfer or a big transfer, makes a lot of good sense. Well, thank you Ed, again for this outstanding session and thank you everyone for attending today's web webinar. Please be informed that this session will be recorded and posted on our website and the YouTube channel along with the slides of the presentation. For more information, visit our website www.pecb.com. Thank you all. Have a great day.